Good morning, church. It is wonderful to be able to gather here in this place. Even though we aren't here at Rocky Mount together, we are still together in spirit. Um, that's what I love about the church. And so while we are apart and while we aren't worshiping every Sunday morning together in the same building, I want to remind you all to make sure that you're checking out our Rocky Mount website to stay on top of any activities or other things that might be going on or any events or any changes uh, in the, the COVID guidelines. Make sure that you're checking our website for that. Also, uh, our Facebook page, as well as our um, Instagram, you can find out information there too. Uh, Rocky Mount Kids and Youth and the Women's Ministry, the Bible Study and the Men's Bible Study, all of those are still active and going on uh, through the month of June. And so uh, reach out uh, to the church office if you're interested in being a part of one of those things. Um, we also want to make sure that we thank you um, so much for all of the food that you have donated to our community. I cannot tell you how amazing it is to serve a church that has given so much. Um, Every Thursday in the month of May, we collected an abundance of food to fill our food pantry. Uh, we were able to also give out food to those in our community that are in need. We will continue um, our food collection in the month of June. So we hope that every Thursday between 12 and 4, you'll come out and be a part of that. And Rocky Mount is a generous church. I think everybody in town knows that. Um, but we are amazed at how generous you all have been to the church um, and uh, donating online and uh, just with your tithes and offerings. We are so blessed as a staff and as a church um, that you are willing and able and giving uh, and loving. We, we appreciate it more than you know. Thank you. So I know you can't wait. I know I can't. It's time to worship our God. Good morning, Rocky Mount. We're so glad that you've joined in with us wherever you are. Just your living room is a sanctuary this morning. Sing with us. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a I'm 
Sing a little louder. Now sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. We can take a second to really dial into the purpose of what we're doing. Right now, wherever you are, dial into this moment. The people around you in this worship, be with them while you be with Jesus. Let's sing this together.
that again, my Jesus. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your
and how powerful it is that you sent your son here to die for us to save our lives God we praise you this morning for all that you've done and will do for us and God we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen i hope everyone has already opened all of their Pentecost presents. I hope that you have already received and gone through your Pentecost basket this morning. I hope everyone by now has mailed out Pentecost cards, you know, complete with your glossy photo of your family. Surely by now those are all mailed out and people have received them and, and, and all of that has happened. Maybe you have planned already to have an, uh, a Pentecost hunt, an egg hunt, uh, this afternoon. No? None of that? You didn't plan any of that? I mean, it's Pentecost. Did, did, did you miss it on the calendar? Uh, just so you don't feel bad, I, I haven't done any of that stuff either. There were no Pentecost presents at my house or cards that I sent out with pictures of Mark and I. That, none of that takes place with Pentecost. And believe it or not, the, the church does celebrate Pentecost today, and it is one of the holiest of days on the church calendar. And yet, it's almost like it's Cinderella. Like it's the Cinderella of all the holy days. I mean, you've got Christmas, and you've got Easter, and you've got Santa, and bunnies, and baskets, and eggs, and presents, and all of that. But, but Pentecost, none of that. None of that happens and it's the celebration of the church, the birth of the church. And we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on Christmas. We celebrate his death and resurrection on Easter. And here we sit, the day of Pentecost, ready to celebrate the birth of the church. The second book of Acts records this dramatic event. And we find um, that those first Jesus followers were still gathered there in Jerusalem. They were all still there. They were in a, in a different upper room, but they were all huddled together. It was about 40 days that they stayed in Jerusalem. And Jesus was there too, the resurrected Jesus. And some of the same folks that had witnessed the death and resurrection of Christ were there 50 days later. Again, the book of Acts marks those days and tells this story. Those followers of Christ huddled in a different upper room, and suddenly this sound of a mighty rushing wind comes in. And before you know it, there are halos of fire on the top of every single believer's head. Something was going on here. Something miraculous was happening Every Christ follower that was assembled there began to speak in a different language, not their native tongue. And just so you understand how incredible this setting was, it was Jews all, from all over the world that were there in Jerusalem. And they heard the mighty rush of the wind, and it startled them. And they came running, and the next thing they hear is a bunch of country Galileans talking in their native tongue. It would be like me, redneck me, trying to talk in French. We, oui. I mean, that's what it would be like. And all of a sudden they heard their own language. People were changed. The Holy Spirit filled every single person that was gathered there. The Holy Spirit literally spoke the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone that could hear it in all of their native tongues. It was so amazing and so bizarre that there were skeptics standing around and they said, 
ah, oh, these people must be drunk. That must be what's going on here because they couldn't explain it. To which Peter stood up and he defended those early followers and said, it's nine o'clock in the morning. There's no way these people are drunk. And then he launched into one of the greatest sermons ever, ever written. It was straight from his heart, though. He started telling them about what Jesus had done for him and how Jesus had literally changed his life. That was the first Christian Pentecost. So how did those early Christ followers, uh, about 120, 125, all of them gathered there in that upper room in Jerusalem, how did they get there? How did they get to that place where the Holy Spirit was in them and working through them and lives were changed? How did they get there? Well, it's just a short hop back up into the first chapter of the book of Acts where we can see and find exactly how the Holy Spirit prepared to break in and break through. If you have your Bibles with me, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to start around verse 3. Here, here are these words. After his suffering, meaning Jesus, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom the whole kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the date the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he said this, and he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, and when suddenly two men dressed in white robes stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, my prayer this morning is that your Holy Spirit will just do just what your word says. That you will speak and you will move through not just my words, but God, that you would speak and move through the meditation of the hearts of those that are hearing this message. God, I pray that everyone who has ears to hear will become witnesses of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that uh, anything that I say here this morning, that it would glorify you and you alone. And God, I ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'll never forget the first adventure I ever had whitewater rafting. I mean, if you've ever been whitewater rafting, you too probably remember that very first time out there on the rapids. In my adventure, it took place probably over 20 years ago now, um, up on the New River in West Virginia. Of course, there was a youth group with me. Uh, some of you may even be watching, um, and you know who you are. But due to my lack of knowledge of river rapids and and not really knowing exactly what I was getting into, we ended up on some of the, the most fierce parts of the New River. For the first time, many of us ever went whitewater rafting. I'll never forget my guide, the guide in the boat. 
Oh, he's a big strapping uh, West Virginia football player. So I felt safe with him. And he gave us all this instruction about how to paddle and what not to do. And, uh, and then some safety tips, just things to keep in mind in case you get thrown out of the boat. And one of those was this. He said, now remember, if you find yourself outside the raft, put your head up and your nose up and look up. Well, I thought that was some of the craziest advice anyone could ever give. Plus, I never really wanted to think about myself being outside of the raft. I, I sort of wanted to stay inside the raft because that seemed like where rafting sort of should take place, right? But this guy, he said, oh, you'll be just fine as long as you look up. Look up. Well, I'm glad that I was paying attention to his safety talk and wasn't like many of the youth that I had with me and they were, you know, worried about how their hair was going to look at the end after wearing this helmet and some of them were making sure they were had you know, enough to eat before we got on the raft. But I was happy about an hour later that I had paid attention to the young strapping football player and his very wise words because I found myself outside the raft. And you know what I did? Instinctively, I put my head up and my hands up and I was under the raft. So suddenly I, I, I panicked, but I just kept hearing what he was saying inside my head, head up, just look up, just keep your head up. And so I did. I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. I'm glad that, that I didn't drown there uh, in the class five rapid that I found myself floating in. But you know, if we're honest, most of us, you know, we don't spend our lives riding rapids. We don't spend our lives out on the river, but we still face oftentimes a wild current. Even though we, we don't get into rough water literally, life can suddenly become rough and rough water is ahead and let's face it, here lately, life has been quite the ride for many of us. We've been through some of the toughest times that we've ever faced, maybe our whole generation has ever faced. It's a difficult time. And so it wouldn't surprise me if someone out there hasn't felt like you were drowning. You were drowning. And so my suggestion to you, my advice to you this morning is to look up to look up. Help can always be found in that direction. In our text, we find the disciples doing just that. We find them looking up. They are waiting for just that last little glimpse of the Messiah. There they stand. I'm sure their knees were shaking as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, simply disappears into the clouds. They stand there just transfixed on the sky, head up, looking, waiting. Maybe he'll come back, they might have thought, gazing into the blue sky and into that cloud where he's just seemed to disappear. And then suddenly these mysterious messengers come walking up, asking an odd question. What are you doing looking into the sky? Why do you stand here looking up and gazing up in the sky? This morning, I want to ask you a similar question. I want to ask you, what is it that you're looking for here this Pentecost Sunday? What are you looking for? Studies show and statistics tell us that most people are looking for three simple things. Three simple things. And the first one is this. People want a meaningful life. People want a purpose in life. That's one of the things that people really seek is a purpose in life. They're looking for something that will make their life count. They're looking for a life that will make a difference in the world. Now, you know, the last couple of months, a lot of folks, maybe you find yourself in this situation where you've lost your job because of COVID-19 and pandemic that has happened that has taken over our whole world and, and changed our lives forever. Maybe, maybe you have found yourself um, either out of a job or 
or maybe your your routine, your your daily routine, your weekly routine has just been just completely discombobulated. And you're you're trying to just figure out where up is at this point. And so that purpose that we have in our lives, maybe maybe our purpose had always been our job and suddenly we're not going to work every day. Or or maybe our purpose was always going and and volunteering at the soup kitchen or volunteering at the nursing home and suddenly we can't and our life and our purpose has been stopped or it seems to have stopped. But I'm always amazed at the way just when we feel like our life has been lost and our meaning and the life that we have has lost purpose, somehow we figure out a different way. You know, I've read stories about baristas that now make masks. Then they're making masks for people and and handing them out. I I read a story about middle schoolers who somehow configured a way of getting a a shield made for those that are on the front lines of this um, virus. And we've all seen the news where it talks about how places that used to make uh, cars for us to drive are now making ventilators that will help keep people all around the world alive. See, we will change and seek a purpose. Purpose and a meaningful life is important to us. The second thing, people are looking for relationships. People are looking for relationships, meaningful, loving, lasting relationships. I think old Waylon Jennings had it right when he said that he was looking for love. Hopefully we're looking for it in all the right places, not the wrong places. And you know, when I think back 20 years ago, it's hard for me to believe that it's been 20 years since uh, the Twin Towers fell, 20 years since the Pentagon was attacked, and an airplane somewhere over Pennsylvania went down from a terrorist attack. Of course, I'm talking about 9-11. I can't believe it's been that long. But that event that day probably showed one of the, the greatest times when people really were looking for a relationship. There are countless accounts of last phone calls, countless numbers of of voicemail messages from the tower, from the Pentagon, and even from that plane, where people called out and said, and basically the, the, the gist of it was, I just want to tell you that I love you. Those folks weren't worried about what their financial portfolios looked like at that moment. They weren't concerned with what they were going to cook for dinner. They, they just wanted to reach out to the people that they love and that they cared for the most, the people that they had the deepest relationship with, and tell them that they matter. People are looking for relationships. So a meaningful life, relationships, and thirdly, people are looking for power in living. Power in living. And I don't mean... Um, political power or even financial power or military power. That's not what I'm talking about here. People are looking for confidence for their journey in life. They're looking for courage to face life's uncertainties. Um, I've decided that, um, that power, uh, that, that I need it in the last couple of months. I need power. I want to share with you um, a, a, a guy named uh, Lloyd John Ogilvy. Uh, it was a book that I had to read, had to, in seminary um, on the book of Acts. And this is what he kind of described as the power that we're looking for. And I think it is so fitting in our time today. He said this, he said, intellectual power was one kind of power that you and I seek. I think he's right. He means wisdom or knowledge or insight, um, anything that might help us in these complex times. He said the second kind of power was spiritual power, and that's faith. That's faith, the spiritual power that we have in faith and confidence and that inner strength that we all desire. Ogilvy said that the other power is emotional emotional power, that deep love, that radiant joy, that compassion that we have for the world. People are looking 
for an energizing, life-giving power for living the daily routine of their lives. So, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I feel, feel like here lately, I just find myself standing around chin up. <laughs> All the time, chin up, standing around, just looking, just as the flood of life kind of comes in, I am just gazing towards the heavens on some days, seeking a purpose or a meaning, hoping for some power to get through the end of the day, and leaning on those relationships that I have in life. And it's funny because the scripture today, Jesus, he gives us the answer for all of those things, those things that we desire, those three things, meaning and purpose and relationships and power. He gives them right there in our text. Jesus says, first of all, he says that if you're looking for a meaning and purpose, then you can find it in the service of Jesus Christ. You can find it by serving him. Right there in, in Acts 1, verse 8, he says, You will be my witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Acts 1, 8 is the cornerstone verse for the church and for witnessing to others. Jesus offers a pur purpose worth dying for. He gives us a vision of a life worth living and going for and to live out the unfinished work of Christ, to be the witness that he wants us to be in this world. He gives us that there. He's saying, what are you doing standing around, gazing up into the sky? You've got work to do, people. You've got things to do. You've got a world to save and a life to give. You've got a story to tell the nations, and, and that story will turn hearts and change lives, and a story of truth and mercy and peace and light. See, those 10 days, those 10 days from the time Jesus ascended into heaven, 10 days passed from the scripture that we have today and the day of Pentecost. It completed the 50 days. Pentecost literally means 50 days. And those same folks who stood gawking in the sky, looking for the last glimpse of Jesus here on earth, would be the very people that he would use to spread the good news to all nations. That he would give the power of the Holy Spirit and dwelling it in them. They would be the same people that would suddenly speak languages they never learned and could never speak so that others in that town and in throughout Jerusalem and in all the region would know the power of Jesus Christ. If you are looking for the meaning and purpose in your life, you can find it in the service of Jesus. The second thing Jesus offered us there is if you're looking for a relationship, loving relationships, if you're looking for fellowship, you can find that in Christ. You can find that in Christ. He says it right there. After Jesus' resurrection, the Bible says that, that he appeared for the next 40 days. I mean, he could have easily been resurrected and gone straight up to heaven. But he wanted to make sure that all of the people there saw him and knew, could touch him, could put their hands in his wounds, could see him, that he truly was the living, resurrected Son of God. And so he walked around, and, and in those days, Jesus' disciples and his mother Mary, his brothers, his friends and his followers, they all saw him during that time. They stayed together. And I've often wondered, I wish we had a transcript of those conversations. I wish that we had all of those conversations for those, those 50 days written down. I wonder what they would have been like. I'm sure there was a lot of laughter and a lot of joy. I'm, I'm sure that there were some tales to be told. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain that there were tears and that there were moments that they embraced one another. I also know that if you read the rest of the New Testament, you see that if that is any indication that there was probably a little bickering, probably, probably a little bickering and maybe a little nitpicking and obviously a little jockeying for power. They started that right there in our text this morning. I'm sure that they were fearful at times and fretful. I, I'm quite certain that they were delighted and depressed at times and just, you know, just doubting and grieving. 
I'm sure that there were all an, a whole array of emotions that took place those 50 days. But when I look at that and I think about that, that time together, you know what it reminds me of? Church. It does. It reminds me of church. Where there's good and there's bad and there's, 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 there's great and fantastic and awful. And there's loss and there's birth and there's happiness. It's church. <laughs> when people ask me, when people ask me, how in the world did you get here? How did you ever end up here? How did you ever end up here talking to, to people on this camera and, and, through, uh, and, and through the internet to spread the word of God? How did I end up in this place today? Pentecost 2020. Well, you know, I could say that I got here because I had a loving grandmother that literally planted the seeds of the gospel in my heart. Me sitting right there on her lap. She planted those seeds. I, I could tell you that, you know, I, I, I had a calling of God that I, I really didn't recognize until I started working with children and youth and, and how that developed. And, and, and I could go on to tell you that uh, I was nurtured and I was by my family and my friends and that is how I got here. And all of that would be true, very true. But there's more to that story. There's more to my story. And, and it's simply this, that if I trace back, if I have to, to say where and how I got here, it, it was the local church. It was a local church, just like Rocky Mount. I was in church in the family of God when I was a kid, and, and for the first time in my life, I felt loved and accepted. I, I really did. You, you know, it, it always um, was difficult for me. You know, growing up, I, I had this birthmark on my hand, and um, it wasn't anything I could hide. And, you know, when you're in you know, elementary school, you have to hold hands a lot, unless there's a virus going around. Um, so there was always noticeable, it was always there, it was always in the forefront. And kids can be mean sometimes. Kids can, can you know, mistreat you, and, um, and they did. They did. And so the church was a place where I could go on Sunday morning and I would be met with the most wonderful Sunday school teachers. Uh, one of my favorites was Mildred McBride. Mildred McBride started in me when I was a little girl, having me stand up in front of my Sunday school class and pray. Here I was, timid, because I didn't know how people thought about me, or I thought people were looking at me, and, and she would have me pray. And then she would pry me with butter cookies and Kool-Aid so that I would do it again and again the next week. Mildred McBride, she sent me cards for my birthday until the day she died, and many of you know that story. She supported me. She was just my Sunday school teacher. As a young mom and, and a young wife, I felt a calling on my life, and it was my pastor, Dana Wooten, that came alongside of me. And all the fears that I have that I had that I was never good enough and that there was no way I could stand in front of my home church or any church and, and talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, Dana would bring me into his office and he would pray over me and pray with me and tell me just how blessed I was. He saw gifts in me that I never saw. And all of a sudden I felt like I was accepted again church has always been that place for me. It was church that held me close through divorce. That small group of, of uh, veteran couples that came alongside of me and spoke their life into me. It was congregations like Rocky Mount and Deep Creek Friends that stood with me and held me up as I laid my parents to rest. See, I realized something. Church. Church is my family. Church is my whole family. Families aren't perfect. No churches are perfect. I mean, we're all here and we're imperfect. And I'd lie to you if I said that there was never someone at church that hurt my feelings or somehow disappointed me in some way. 
or tried their best to turn me from uh, my goal of, of, of living a faithful life in Christ. Those people have been there. But overwhelmingly, this family that we don't share blood and we don't have the same DNA, we share the blood of Jesus Christ and it covers all of us, that is the family that has changed me my church family. And if you are looking for loving relationships, you don't have to look any further because they're here. They're right here. And lastly, if you're looking for power, not the kind that comes from military or wealth, but the kind of power that can change your life, look no further. You can find that in the Holy Spirit, in the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And that is what Pentecost is all about. Jesus gives that promise right there in the text. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power for living, confidence to face the uncertainty of life, hope in the face of loss, assurance in time of fear. And no doubt there were difficult times. There were difficult times that laid ahead of of those early followers in that first church. And there are difficult times that we face right now, and there will be even more ahead of us. But Christ, Christ is there, and the Spirit of Christ is there. And in the world, there are plenty of reasons for us to have genuine fear. And if there is a lack of genuine fear, there is someone there that is willing to stir up every fear that we have deep inside of us. Fear is always going to be with us. There's always going to be someone to exploit that. But the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in you as a believer, combats that fear, changes that life. For every real fear, hear me, there is just as real an assurance of God's Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. For every real fear that you faced, there is just as real an assurance of God's Holy Spirit for you and for me. His Spirit is present with us in life. He is present with us in the life of God's people to enable us to live in that assurance and in that hope. So you didn't get anything this year for Pentecost. There was no Pentecost present. No one dressed up in a red suit and came down your chimney. There was no oversized rodent running around um, with a basket and some eggs. None of that took place. And it's not going to. Just because we don't celebrate Pentecost like we do Christmas or Easter doesn't make it any less valuable. In fact, there might be more value than you, can, you and I will ever realize. See, when you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we become children of God, the promise that's made there in Acts to us is that His Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. That day at Pentecost, those holy halos hovered over each one of those individuals gathered in that upper room but they were gathered together. So the Holy Spirit came individually and it came collectively and there was a mighty rush of power and wind that took place. And before the day was over, 3,000 people were saved and knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. And today, 2,000 years more later, you and I are still celebrating We're still talking about it. Our God in heaven chooses to use people broken and insufficient like you and me to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the message of Pentecost, that you and I are God's literal tools in this world. He uses us by the power of his Holy Spirit to change people's lives, starting with you. Would you pray with me? Father God, we are so grateful that you choose to work through us. 
God, we are so grateful that you take our brokenness, you take our shame, and when your Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, you change us. God, when we become your children, it is our duty to, to fulfill the call to go out and to spread the good news. And Lord, we don't do that. We don't do that from a pulpit. We don't do it um, from a message. We don't go necessarily door to door and knock on the door and, and tell people about Jesus. No, God, we share our story. Each individual story, Lord, is the, the story that you have laid on our hearts and God, we may not have to speak in a foreign language. We may not have to, to tell somebody the good news in French or German or, or Arabic, God. But we can tell someone our story and they will hear it because they have a need that meets ours. They have a, have a desire. They have a, a problem like something that we have faced. And when we're honest and we say, come alongside of me. Let me show you what Jesus has done for me. God, your holy power speaks. Lord, I just pray for those that are um, sitting at home and that are, are in their pajamas and, and drinking coffee. I just pray, God, that, that right in this moment, that if they have not accepted Christ as their Savior, God, if, if they're not one of your children, if they, if they don't know you, that they will. That they'll seek out someone, someone here at Rocky Mount, someone that can come alongside of them and show them the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that will bring them the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Powerful lives, God. That is what we all desire. And Lord, I ask this now in the holy name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let a rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come near earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal so lay down your burden Yes, lay down your chain. Dog who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wonder of God, oh, you're not too far. So lay down your There's hope for the hopeless And all those who stray Come sit at the table Come taste the grace There's a rest for the weary The rest that endures Earth has no sorrow That heaven can cure So lay down your
morning, oh sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. And earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burden. We're so glad that you joined us today here at Rocky Mount. May the God of love, may the grace of Christ, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this week. Have a great week.